Hello. This is just a dis where we talk about Blu-rays. My name's Brian. I have some new discs I'd like to share with you. And uh, I'm not going to waste any time. I'm wearing the shirt. So let's start with him. Jim Jarmusch, Ghost Dog, Criterion. Very excited about this. I've already dug into it a bit. And uh, it did not disappoint. For those that don't know, this is Jarmusch's film from 1999, starring Forrest Whitaker and uh, Henry Silva and others. And he plays a very... Um, I mean, he's he's a guy who <laughs> who lives by the way of the samurai, as the title as the title would suggest, and it's a really interesting character because he's very sort of you know chill about everything, uh, and yet he's a hired killer, and he is well. I'll show you something here. So there's the inside, right? Uh, we got our booklet, but we also have this. Now this is neat because the Hagakure is this little book that he's reading throughout the movie and they have um, all these little, you know, sayings that he reads that sort of narrate the movie but also divide it, you know, like they'll just be, he'll read something, we'll see it on the screen and it's sort of a lesson to live by kind of thing. Um, Oh, this is the first one in the movie. I'll just read this one to you. The way of the samurai is found in death. Meditation on inevitable death should be performed daily. Every day when one's body and mind are at peace, one should meditate upon being ripped apart by arrows, rifles, spears, and swords, being carried away by surging waves, being thrown into the midst of a great fire, being struck by lightning, being shaken to death by a great earthquake, falling from thousand-foot cliffs, dying of disease, or committing seppuku at the death of one's master. And every day, without fail, one should consider himself as dead. This is the substance of the way of the samurai. Such so is one of the little sayings, and uh, I'm sure that all that come up in the movie are in this book, a booklet here. It's actually like sort of a fold-out. Uh, but I just love that they included excerpts from the Book of the Samurai in this disc. I think that's wonderful. Um, but so anyway, the story. Basically, um, Boris Whitaker plays Ghost Dog. He's a hired killer. He lives on the roof of a building. Uh, there's a little shack there, uh, and he lives there, sleeps there. He has a bunch of pigeons that he keeps, and he has been sort of commissioned by this mobster dude to do hits for him and he pays him every autumn for the last year's round of business but if the mobster guy wants to communicate with him basically uh one of his pigeons one of ghost dog's pigeons flies to this guy's house every day and if he has a message for him he can write it on a very small piece of paper tuck it into the bird's um leg it's got like a little holster there and it flies back to Forrest Whitaker's character and then he will act upon it. So the setup basically is that Ghost Dog is hired to kill uh, another mobster made guy by sort of Henry Silva slash one of his um, dudes that's slightly under him. Like Henry Silva is sort of a boss type in this. And by the way, it's great to see Henry Silva as old as he is. Uh, when he filmed this in this movie. He's got some great little bits of dialogue. He doesn't say very much. But anyway, Ghost Dog is hired to kill this guy. He does so. There is a witness. It is bad. And it sets in motion the mobsters trying to kill him, despite the fact that he was just doing what he was told to do. So that's kind of where it goes. Um it is very much influenced by, say, Jean-Pierre Melville and, like, you know, Le Samurai. And um, I know Jim Jarmusch mentions that uh, Seijin Suzuki was a big influence and his film Branded to Kill is definitely in here as well, if you've seen that one. Um, but there's some interesting 
features on this. Um, and the one that I like the most, it's a new Q&A with Jarmusch in which he responds to questions sent in by fans. It's an hour and 24 minutes, I want to say. Um, or is it 124 minutes? Either way, it's a, it's a, I think it's about 84 minutes and it's just Jarmusch basically doing an AMA podcast style. You know, he reads the names of the people, he reads the questions, he responds to the questions, you know, his initial like laugh or whatever he might have. Uh, and there's a lot of good questions in there. They ask him about the movie. They ask him about certain things the character does. They ask him about influences. Somebody asks him uh, what music he's been listening to during lockdown, which is great. I took notes. I was like, oh, that's cool. Um, and again, with the influences, I actually have a couple tie-in films for this one. And one is not an influence and one he mentioned as a favorite. So I watched it and I liked it. But um, this came out last year from Arrow. This is also Jarmish, uh, also a Hitman movie and also really good. I mean, I like Ghost Dog better, but this was one I hadn't seen until last year when this came out. And I was pleasantly surprised. So it's not exactly like Ghost Dog 2 or anything like that, but... Um, Definitely another Jarmusch Hitman movie that I recommend if you like Ghost Dog and you haven't seen it. Uh, this one's a little weirder, as weird as Ghost Dog gets. Weird in the Jarmusch sense. It's a very relative term because I really enjoy the... I don't know. Weird isn't right. Just whatever the idiosyncratic nature of the Jarmusch films and universe. Um, but anyway, this is a really good Arrow special edition for Jarmusch. Uh, briefly... Speaking of Henry Silva, I picked this up as well uh, earlier, and I heard Jarmusch mention this as a movie that he liked very much that was influential on Ghost Dog, and I can kind of see it. I just watched this last night, and it's a good Henry Silva movie from uh, 1963. And he basically plays... Like, uh, he's, a, he's a hero in, I want to say, Italy... He's sort of a folk hero, uh, Robin Hood type, you know, circa World War II. And he gets sort of hooks up with a mobster who helps him fake his own death and then basically sort of asks him to do his bidding, which is to go to the U.S. and to help him take out various mob bosses uh, and sort of... I won't, go, I won't go too far into it, but he's really good. Like Silva's really good as this Johnny Cool character, and he has a romance with um, what's her name Elizabeth Montgomery from Bewitched, and uh, I really enjoyed this. This is a really solid movie. It's on Amazon Prime too, if you're curious about it. But this recent Scorpion Blu-ray, which does not have any features at all, unfortunately, um, was the way I watched it. But it was literally off of a recommendation from Jim Jarmusch. So if you watch Ghost Dog, you want something to chase Ghost Dog. Uh, this is another one man against the mob kind of movie that you could check out. Anyway, so that's Ghost Dog. Uh, I'll just real briefly, uh, there's a couple other features here. Uh, there's a conversation between uh, Forrest Whitaker and Isaac DeBankel, who is actually the guy in Limits of Control. He's also in this movie. He plays an ice cream man that doesn't speak English and Ghost Dog, and he have this fun relationship that's really neat uh so they have a, a q a moderated by film scholar michael b gillespie which is cool it's just recollections of the film and talking about the themes and stuff it, it's neat it's a zoom call type thing that was good uh there is also flying birds the music of ghost dog which is a video essay on riza's score by filmmaker daniel rame and that was cool it shows uh you know, it's an interview with Riza, and then they cut to various scenes, and they'll say, like, in the lower corner, like, Riza's theme or Ghost Dog main theme, and they'll play a section of it, and I'll show you the part of the movie that it's in. Um, because I'm not sure all of the score ever made it to the soundtrack, because the Riza owns it. And that's another thing Jarmusch comments on in his Q&A is, that's my arrangement with composers. I can't afford to buy them out, so they're 
you know, giving me music, but then they own it and they can release it as they see fit. And I don't think RZA, don't quote me on this, I don't think he's released the whole score as an album. He re- released a soundtrack album with excerpts, but I think this little video essay actually has a few more examples. Anyway, I, I dug it. Um, and then there's, uh, let's see, The Odyssey, A Journey into the Life of a Samurai, a 2000 program on the making of the film. Deleted scenes and art outtakes, archival interviews. Uh, there's an interview with a casting director, Ellen Lewis. It's a really solid Criterion. Definitely one of my favorite Criterion re- releases from uh, 2020. If you're a Jarmish fan, it's a must. Ghost Dog. One more Criterion here. Girlfriends. Directed by Claudia Weil. From 1978. Starring uh, Melanie Mayron and uh, Bob Balaban and Christopher Guest and Kenneth McMillan shows up for a second and Eli Wallach has a really big role. Um, this is a really neat movie and I think an important movie and one that I only discovered a couple years ago, I think, but my appreciation for it has grown uh, substantially since that first viewing. And this disc is really great if you're a fan of the film. Um, it's basically the story of uh, a young woman living in New York. That's Melanie Mayron's character. And she and her sort of best friend have an apartment together. You know, she's a photographer just getting by. And early on in the movie, her friend basically tells her, I'm getting married. And she's getting married to Bob Balaban's character. And it kind of, it doesn't shatter her, but it's just like, oh, you know, we just got this apartment together. Now we're going to split up. Now I'm going to be living alone. And so she's sort of dealing with living alone in New York, um, dealing with men, dealing with trying to get her consistent work with the photography thing and trying to decide if that's maybe even the thing she wants to do. Uh, it's just a really wonderful performance by Melanie Mayron, and um, she would go on to be on Thirty Something, but she had done a couple films before this. She's in um, Harry and Tonto. She's really good with Art Carney in that movie, um, but she's just a really great, you know, actor. That is, it's funny because Claudia Weil has a cool interview on here, and she talks about just the whole where she came from she started in documentary filmmaking and how that led up to feature filmmaking and how she sold the film and her idea for the film at least she's sort of a co-story on it and sort of her ideas about you know the characters that would traditionally be side characters the less conventionally attractive characters that you know, are always sort of pigeonholed and they're sidekicks. And she was like, why can't we have a movie that's all about that person? I can relate more to that person. And so, yeah, so it's, like I said, it's Melanie Maron's character dealing with men in New York. And there's a lot of interesting folks. Bob Balaban is great. Christopher Guest is interesting in his small role. But it's just a really neat sort of slice of life um indie feeling film and i really really like it a lot um claudia weil would go on to direct it's my turn with jill clayberg and uh oh shoot who else is in that movie charles grodin and michael douglas um that's a good studio movie but i think i still prefer this um, so if you haven't seen this, it might be on Criterion Channel right now, so you can check that out. But I was really dug the extras on this one because, it, like I said, it has that new interview with Claudia Weil. Then it has a new interview with Weil, Christopher Guest, Melanie Mayron, and Bob Balaban, all sort of re- recalling their memories about the film. I want to say that's about the Mayron inter- or the Claudi- Claudia Weil interview is like 26 minutes, and the new interview with the actors and her is about 16 minutes then there's an interview with the screenwriter Vicky Pallon Uh, I didn't get to that one yet Uh, there's a new interview with uh, Weil and filmmaker Joey Soloway which is really good again just sort of a straight talk about influences and 
uh, you know, two filmmakers talking to each other, and um, it was good. I really liked that one too. Uh, th- what's also cool, and this is what I really like, they include a couple documentaries that she made, uh, that Wilde made. One is called Commuters. It's a 1970 short film by Wilde and somebody called Elliot Noyes. And it's basically silent. It's just showing a couple different points of view of commuters. It's only about three and a half minutes. But more interestingly is her documentary, Joyce at 34, which is not from 1972. It's less than 30 minutes, um, but it's directed by her and this woman, Joyce Ch- Chopra, who's basically a filmmaker that Claudia Weil knows who has gotten pregnant and is having a little girl and she's dealing with the transition from not being a parent and being a working woman to becoming a parent and trying to maintain that lifestyle and it's got a lot of interesting scenes like there's scenes of like some kind of mother's group where they're all talking about how tough it is to to raise a child and continue to work. And then there's a group of women that I think are Joyce's, um, Joyce's mom's friend. Like she comes from a Jewish family. The woman Joyce does. And there's a great dinner scene. It's like all these older women talking about, you know, just their lives and bringing up kids. And it's just a really fascinating look at parenthood, you know, if you will. And, um, so I really dug this disc. It's actually another one of my favorite uh, discs that Criterion has put out this year. So I got two in a row that I think are fantastic. So that's my Criterions. Then I've got uh, some Kino stuff here. A little change of pace. Book Rogers in the 25th Century. This is from 1979. It is basically the pilot for the Buck Rogers TV show, but they... Um, there's some differences. Uh, I was listening to the commentary from Steve Mitchell and Nathaniel Thompson, and they were talking about how, you know, this is obviously shot in 185, and the TV version is different, and there's different scenes, and there's certain things they had to do with certain characters to conti- to uh, maintain a continuity into the series. But this movie is a lot weirder and darker than I remembered. Like, there's this whole sequence... When Buck, I mean, the, the whole idea is that Buck Rogers is, what, he's an astronaut? I can't remember if he's an astronaut or not. But he he's in space, and he ends up sort of in suspended animation for like 500 years from 1987, I want to say, they, they are setting it in, to 21-whatever. And, you know, now it's this new... Uh, futuristic society and um, but there's this whole scene where Buck is running around with uh, the little robot and it's like it's like Omega Man or something you know there's all these zombie dudes and stuff there's just a bunch of stuff I didn't remember and I was very much enjoying it I mean and Henry Silva again is in this as well so we've got a Henry Silva through line on this little video here Um, and Silva is really good as the sort of you know, big villain of the movie, but Aaron Gray, of course, and, uh, Gil Gerard as, uh, Mr. Buck Rogers, uh, brand new 2K master. Um, this is from producer, uh, Glenn A. Larson, who of course did Battlestar Galactica, Knight Rider. I mean, he's ubiquitous in terms of the television productions. One of the most successful television producers, uh, maybe ever, and um, this is a big hit show for him. Uh, he used to come into the video store where I worked at, by the way, and um, he would always have somebody with him. Sort of had a small entourage. He definitely, he definitely wore the, uh, you know, the the vibe of a very successful industry type pretty well. Although he was nice, but you just got a sense when he walked around. It just felt like this is an important guy. And to be fair, like I said, one of the most successful TV producers. So, um, But this is a fun movie, and I was really excited to get this Blu-ray. I know that the series is also coming from Kino. I hope to get that as well. Um, but, yeah, this is just an enjoyable, you know, slice of post-Star Wars 
science fiction cinema from the late 70s, which I kind of like, Star Wars knockoffs. I think they're always interesting. Um, what they do different, what they do the same, uh, how they change things up. So that is Buck Rogers. Also more Kino. And I've got another, actually, TV adaptation. This is Dragnet from 1954 the television uh, show turned movie in the commentary this one by film historian Toby Roan he was saying and I could have misheard him but I thought he said that this was the first uh, TV show adapted into a movie ever and um, obviously a highly successful TV show created and produced and starring Jack Webb and this is directed by Jack Webb uh, this disc actually has both a 1751 version and a 1371 version, a square version of the movie. And um, it's a new 2K master. Uh, it's in color, you know, so that's kind of cool. Uh, but it's, you know, it's a, it's a more edgy dragnet, you know. It's uh, 88 minutes, and it opens with, like, a murder of Dub Taylor, if you remember the Hubba Bubba bubblegum commercials. <laughs> Dub Taylor is like walked out into this like open field area and gets shot like in the face and it's like bloody. It's not like blood splattering, but it's, you know, you see some blood and he's killed and that's like the opening incident in the movie. And, and then it becomes sort of a pr procedural from there as the, it always is with this. Um, but it's got a really good cast because it includes uh, Richard Boone and Dennis Weaver and there's a bunch more. And that one thing I liked about Toby Roan's commentary, what I'd heard of it was he was going through all the actors and how they, uh, what they had done before this and if they had worked with Jack Webb before and had they been on the show. And there was definitely people that he brought in from the show to be in this movie. Um, so I don't know. This is a cool one. You know, I like, <laughs> I like Jack Webb. The Joe Friday character I think is interesting. And obviously he personified it 100%. So anyway, it's neat to see this on Blu-ray as well. I've got, like I said, two TV adaptations. Then we have something a little more serious, uh, Billy Wilder's The Lost Weekend. Now this had come out through Masters of Cinema, and I don't remember if I have that version, so I can't compare them, but I think it might have had a few more features than this. This has a film historian uh, commentary from Joseph McBride, um, but I think the Masters of Cinema might have had a little bit more. But uh, this is a brand new 4K Master. I also can't comment as to whether or not that's the same 4K Master that was likely used on the Masters of Cinema Blu-ray. I don't know. Um, but uh, this, of course, is Billy Wilder, a uh, story of Ray Milland as a guy struggling with alcoholism, having a lost weekend, a tough... Um, you know, heavy drinking weekend and, you know, just going to some really dark places. And, uh, you know, it's it's a good movie. I'm trying to think if it won. Yeah, uh, won Oscars for Best Picture, Best Director, Best Actor, Ray Milland, Best Screenplay, Charles Brackett and Billy Wilder, and was nominated for Best Cin Cinematography, John F. Seitz, Best Editing as well, and Best Score, Miklos Rosa. So, yeah, this was a sweeper in terms of all the Academy Awards. Oh, they put it right on the front there. Um, and Gene Wyman's in it. It's a, it's a tough one. It's a movie that I like uh, in terms of Billy Wilder. I love Billy Wilder, but it is a tougher film to watch. You know, this and Days of Wine and Roses are two that I respect as films more than I like to throw them on for an evening watch. Uh, but I am very curious to see the 4K master on this one uh, in black and white. I'm sure that's going to look wonderful. So I can't wait to dig into The Lost Weekend. Um, that makes a lot of Billy Wilder stuff available on Blu-ray. I think they still have a few to go, but between, especially between imports and uh, the States, there's not too many Billy Wilder films you can't get on Blu-ray now, which is a good position to be in. Anyway, that is Lost Weekend. Just a few more here. This is an import BFI. I picked this up from uh, Diabolic DVD. Um, this is a really fascinating movie, and it is from 1953. And it is 
not exactly a silent film, but there's no dialogue, at least in one. They have multiple versions, I think, here. Um, a Woman's Nightmare of Murder, Maiming, and Mistrust proves to be more than a mere dream in John Parker's influential horror. Uh, stripped of dialogue using only sound effects and an unnerving score by George Anthiel, uh, who did the ballet mechanique. Uh, Parker combines horror and film noir and expressionistic methods to depict a mind descending into madness. Shocking audiences upon its original release, the film was initially banned by the New York State Film Board, who deemed it inhuman, indecent, and the quintessence of gruesomeness. Uh, foreshadowing the likes of Roman Polanski's Repulsion, Dementia is now available on Blu-ray for the first time. This one I had gotten on DVD years and years ago, and that DVD went out of print uh, and was pretty expensive, so this one was tough to see. There might have been some kind of streaming version that I don't know if it was the best print, um, but I can't wait to check this one out. Uh, it says, I, I'm looking for anything about the new master. It just says presented in high definition and standard. Uh, but it's got a lot of good extras too. Uh, newly recorded audio commentary on dementia by film critic and editor in chief of Diabolique magazine, Kat Ellinger. She comes up just about every video I do now and I'm okay with that. I love that. Uh, so I want to hear Kat's thoughts on that. Uh, there's something called Daughter of Horror, 1957, 55 minutes. After being picked up by producer Jack H. Harris, Dementia was re-released as Daughter of Horror. Whilst also featuring music without dialogue, Harris, Harris made a number of edits and added narration by actor Ed McMahon. Uh, so that's interesting. That's an alternate version of the film with a narration and... Um, I don't, I'm, I don't know if they're saying it uses the same score or if it's a new score. I, I'm going to have to check out both versions. There's something called Alone with the Monsters, 1958, 16 Minutes, a study of people's unconscious cruelty to others. This bold experimental film was directed by Natsli Not, Not, Not Noor with cinematography by the great Walter Lassily. Uh, Joe, Dante, Joe Dante does a trailer from hell. You can look that up on YouTube as well. Uh, and then before and after restoring Dementia, uh, 2015, three minutes, a series of short clips from Dementia illustrate the work done by the Cohen Film Collection for their 2015 restoration. Uh, yeah, so okay, so it has been restored in the last five years, but I don't know if I knew if Cohen did a Blu-ray. I don't know. This is a nice uh, disc, though. It is, of course, region B locked, and you're going to need a multi-region player to play it. But if you're into expressionistic noir horror, um, this is pretty good stuff. Could double well with uh, Carnival of Souls. It's kind of in that territory. It's also pretty short. It's like 56 minutes. So uh, a quick view, but very stylish, very, you know, dark nightmare. It's, it's good stuff. I'm excited that I got this from Diabolic. And while I was at Diabolic, they had um, this marked down, and I don't know if it'll still be on sale when this video goes live, but this is a Screen Factory disc that I didn't happen to have, uh, and so I do sometimes like to pick up the occasional Screen Factory. I'm not trying to have a complete Screen Factory collection by any means, but if I can get one, I want to say this was like eight or nine bucks. I was like, oh yeah, no, I'll check that out. I've never seen that movie. Um, it's a new 2K scan, uh, and it is directed by Ian Curtis. It has a new interview with director Ian Curtis, uh, actress Mary Peach, production designer Peter Mullins, sound editor Brian Blamey, and composer Kenneth V. Jones, alternate opening. Um, it says a million bolts of death in each of his hands. Dr. Paul Steiner and Dr. Christopher Mitchell have created a projection device that can transmit any object over the distance of a few miles. The device works well on inanimate objects, but using it on a living device on a living device brings horrific consequences. When Steiner accidentally is accidentally projected, he becomes a disfigured monster who has the ability to kill by electrocution. And he looks like that. So, I don't know. I Like I said, I haven't seen this one yet, uh, but uh, for uh, not a lot of money, I was like, yeah, I'll put that in my Screen Factory collection. Uh, it's from... What year is it from? 1967. The Projected Man. Just a few more here. 
Um, this one is an older title. It's an Olive Films title. I bought it used. Uh, I covered Grace of My Heart recently uh, in my last update. And one of the things that is a great feature, and I mentioned it in that episode or that video, is um, director Allison Anders talking about working with Scorsese and the she mentions that they watched a lot of musicals and I know Scorsese has a fondness for the darker downbeat musicals you know like Love Me or Leave Me which also has Doris Day um, I think there's one called Blue Skies with Bing Crosby and Fred Astaire and uh, you know of course um, oh shoot I can't think of the other ones they mentioned but uh, they're interesting to watch, especially when taken into potential influence on New York, New York, which is a Scorsese film that I like quite a bit and uh, is a very sort of dark musical. Um, anyway, Alison Anders mentions that she and Scorsese watched this, and she made it sound like they watched it more than once while they were working on Grace of My Heart. So I was like, okay, I've never seen that. I know the song, uh, but I don't know... Uh, too much about this movie. Directed by Gordon Douglas, also stars Gig Young and Ethel Barrymore and Dorothy Malone. Uh, centers on a family headed by a music music loving patriarch, Robert Keith, and his musically inclined daughter is looking for romance. Doris Day plays the youngest daughter. Uh, let's see, like a composer becomes, who comes for an extended visit and eventually wins the hearts of all three sisters. Sinatra plays Barney Sloan, a cynical songwriter hired by Alex to do arrangements for an upcoming Broadway show. And anyway, uh, it goes dark. That's I won't give away too much because I don't actually want to read the back of this too much because I kind of want to go in as fresh as possible. But just knowing that an older film that I haven't seen like this one was an influence on a newer film, albeit a 90s film that I like, uh, is enough for me to want to check it out. It's also available streaming. Um... There's Doris and Frank on the back. So that is Young at Heart. Just a couple more quick things here. This is another one. Uh, it's Kino and Scorpion releasing. Uh, it's a, It's got quite a cast. Uh, it's called King of the Mountain. And it's kind of like a street racing movie. By no means is it uh, Fast and the Furious. But, I mean, look at this cast. You've got Harry Hamlin, Joseph Bottoms, Dan Haggerty, uh, Grizzly Adams, and Dennis Hopper. I'll look at Dennis on the back there. Uh, and Harry Hamlin, of course, who we love from uh, L.A. Law and from Clash of the Titans. Um, this one I've seen, but I can't remember that well. Uh, I guess Hamlin works at a Porsche repair garage by day, and at night... He reigns as king of the mountain, the most successful of a group of uh, that participate in races along Mulholland Drive on the hills over Los Angeles in his highly tuned 356 Speedster, which would be that car you see on the front there. And um, I want to say there's somebody... Oh, Seymour Cassell is in this. Oh, Deborah Van Valkenburg. That's who I was trying to think of. Uh, from the Warriors, she's... Um, She's a Walter Hill favorite. I like her a lot. So it's a cult cast. In that sense, a kind of a cult movie. Um, and uh, it is... It's just one of those, like... But now his friend's focus has shifted away from racing in favor of potential careers in the music industry, leaving Steve to reign as king alone. Uh, Steve is egged on by Cal Dennis Hopper, the former king. Uh, when Steve meets Tina, Deborah Van Valkenburg. Steve is also torn between choosing Tina over his life as a racer and continuing as king. Uh, so, you know, you have just conflicts of, uh, of moving on and changing your position in life. Not quite a midlife crisis movie necessarily, but um, featuring a hot soundtrack that includes Styx's Renegade, Robert Palmer's Looking for Clues, uh, directed by Noel Nosick, who did Youngblood, the hockey movie with Rob Lowe and Patrick Swayze. Uh, I don't know if I've talked about this that on the channel, but I'm a big fan of that one. It also has Cynthia Gibb in it, who is one of my favorites. Um, so it's interesting that this is 
before Young Blood. Um, but I like that film and I like him as a director. So I'm curious uh, to rewatch this. I think I saw this on digital, but I didn't haven't seen this Blu-ray yet. It has an interview with Harry Hamlin, interview with Noel Nosek. Oh, Noel Nosek also did. Um, I think he also did this movie, Best Friends, which is on Vinegar Syndrome, and one of my favorite sort of discovery type movies, like a really interesting buddy movie turned dark thriller from the late 70s. Really intriguing movie from Vinegar Syndrome. Definitely worth a look if you haven't seen that. I wondered why I recognize that name. Anyway, so this is car racing, street racing movie with Harry Hamlin. I want to see it. All right, and last but not least, you've seen this one talked about a lot, but why not one more time? Arrow's Last Starfighter. Um, this one has, of course, the slip cover. Cool looking disc inside. And um, brand new restoration from a 4K scan of the original 35 millimeter camera negative. So it looks pretty good. You know, uh, I was watching that and I was impressed with it. Uh, you know, I wondered why they didn't go 4K with this one, as they have been with some other catalog titles, but uh, it looks good. Um, and it's got a ton of features, audio commentary with Mike White from the projection booth, archival audio commentary with director Nick Castle and production designer Ron Cobb. Um, let's see here. Catherine Mary Stewart remembering her um, role in the film. Uh, a, a, a composer interview. Let's see, a new interview with screenwriter Jonathan Butel, uh, special effects. What's the one that I saw that I liked? Oh, here we go. Greeting Starfighter inside the arcade game. An interview with an arcade game collector, Estelle Vance, on reconstruction, reconstructing the Starfighter game. Basically, obviously, you know the plot of the movie is that Alex Rogan lives in a trailer park. He plays the last starter, Starfighter video game and gets like a million points. And then you find out that he's actually been recruited <laughs> to go into space and, you know, f and fight as a star pilot. Um, and Robert, uh, Robert Preston comes down and tries to bring him up to space. Um, obviously a big influence on, um, well, I was going to say, the um, Spielberg movie, Ready Player One, the book, uh, Ernest Cline, I think, talks about Last Starfighter there, but if you haven't read Ernest Cline's next book, which is called Armada, it's 100% last... I mean, it's, they even more specifically reference Last Starfighter, but it's very much a newish take on Last Starfighter that is a bit more Earthbound than Spacebound, which this movie is. Um, so if you haven't read... Uh, well, I, I listened to it on tape. I listened to uh, Will Wheaton read both Ready Player One and Armada, and I do recommend that. It's a great 80s nostalgia trip to hear the voice of Will Wheaton talking. About. Anyway, um, so, so, so this guy, um, the video game in the movie, they just made up enough sequences to make it look like a real thing, but it was never actually released as a video game. But as some collectors are want to do uh there is sort of a cult of guys and gals that collect these games that want to recreate the ones they've seen in movies that didn't actually exist you know i'm trying to think of the other ones they give some examples and right now i'm blanking on oh like bishop of battle from nightmares and ah, there's a couple others that are only in movies that people have gone and made their own versions of so this guy and some friends of his put together the cabinet and then the game itself based on the footage that's in the film, but also creating their own footage or their own sort of game bits based on some other stuff that happens in the movie. So it's, I think he said it's like maybe like 25 minutes of play or maybe 40 minutes. I can't remember, but it's super cool to see him talk about it and go through some of the game itself it's just pretty cool to see this game in real life being played you know obviously there aren't a lot of them but he was able to sort of program the game and 
make it into an arcade game board and put that anyway I thought that was a fun feature but there's a ton of great features on this definitely worth your time uh, if you want uh, an 80s fix this was on sale recently half off on Amazon but it probably won't be by the time this goes live but um, I had to pick it up I had to get some last starfighter action going so that is from arrow and that will do it for my uh, latest update I'm gonna just show you the stack uh, all in one I think that's right so that is what I talked about uh, thank you very much for watching and uh, if you've picked up anything recently that you were excited about anything from the criterion sale or just general pickups from boutique labels that you might be um, really excited to check out. I'd love to hear about it in the comments below. Please like and subscribe if you enjoy these sort of updates so I can know that you want me to continue to do them. Uh, but uh, thank you for watching. Bye-bye.